Good morning, Grace Place family. How are you? Good awesome. Great. We had a wonderful Saturday night. Not only uh, the gathering and people, you know, are really getting connected there and loving each other. A lot of it is due to, I think, what Scott and Nancy are doing with the Saturday night gathering afterwards for food. And so a lot of them are really close. And it's always great for them to get to see each other. But God was really moving. And we expect that. We want you to open your hearts and lives to what God wants to do today. Well, we started a series last week. If you missed uh, the first part, I want to encourage you to go back. You can find all of our messages online at uh, graceplaceaustin.com under uh, sermons. And so you have last week we talked about fear not. This week we're going to talk about worry not. Now, we've, we talked last week about how the first century church uh, carried uh, the good news. They did not have what you and I have. They did not have the New Testament. They did not have uh, the Bible incomplete. Uh, you know, in many of their gatherings, the church, they were they were going on what Jesus was saying. They were remembering uh, his words and his teachings to them and sharing them with one another and encouraging uh, those. Uh, they did not have until we talked about last week, probably 50 years, um, some of Paul's writings uh, after uh, Jesus had uh, been resurrected and, and ascended up into heaven. So. They were working on what we call uh, resurrection religion. They were remembering what Jesus had told them and taking that in. And some of the things that Jesus had said were really challenging for them when he was teaching. And uh, they, it was, they are really centered around what we call the not commandments. These were things that were really hard to get their minds around. Last night or last weekend, we were talking about fear not. This weekend, uh, we're looking at worry not. And it was really challenging for them to think through about how to get their minds around uh, not doing something that is so natural. It's, it's just such a part of our daily lives uh, to worry. And so today we're going to tackle that most imposing maybe command of all, that worry not. And we're going to put it in Old Testament language, so we're going to say, thou shalt not Let's try it again. Thou shalt not worry. Remember the Ten Commandments with Moses and the booming voice of God? Thou shalt not worry. All right? I've worried uh, in my life about first impressions. I've worried about political correctness. I've worried about identity theft. I've worried about contagious infections. And yet for all of my worry, in spite of all my worry, I'm alive. Uh, I'm well. And... Thankfully, my bills are paid. <laughs> All of our worry really doesn't seem to resolve anything, does it? And so in Matthew uh, chapter 6, we're going to go through the passage there starting at verse 25. So I want you to find your way to Matthew. If you have your Bibles, open them up. Somebody tell me where, what page Matthew chapter 6 is on. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin with verse 25. Anybody have a page number? 685. 685. What else do we have? 960. 960. Somebody has a study Bible. <laughs> 1550. 1550. Somebody has a big study Bible. Okay. <laughs> All right. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry. Now the reason that Jesus could say this was because he knew something that you and I know, but we tend to forget. Jesus put uh, what he knows about worry into this passage. So we're going to unpack it and kind of take a look at what Jesus' perspective is for us and what the one that he wants us to carry in life with respect to our understanding of worry. Matthew, uh, in Luke chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus said, Who of you, by worry, can add a single hour or moment to anyone's life. Who of you, by worry, can add a single moment to anyone's life? Maybe I should say it like this to us this morning. Who of you, by worry, has probably taken a year off of your life? Anybody? <laughs> Who of you, by worry, has more than likely agitated people around your life and really caused them frustration, all right? <laughs> Then going down to verse 25 and reading all the way through here, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What will you what will eat? 
or drink or about your body? What will you wear? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? I want you to know that all of worry, Jesus points out first, is about the future. All of our worry is about the future. It is, it is about, you know, what you will eat or drink or what you will wear. You, you're solved. Your problem is solved now. You've just eaten or you're about to eat. You know, all that's taken care of. It's always about tomorrow, isn't it? Worry is always about the future. It's always about what, what am I going to eat tomorrow? What am I going to wear tomorrow? And in the first century church was a little bit different. We need to understand where they were coming from than where we are today. And, and basically, they were, this was big concern for them, what Jesus was talking about. What am I going to eat and what am I going to wear? These were the primary front concerns. You ever seen Maslow's hierarchy of learning, a little, you know, uh, pyramid, if you will. Those of you who studied maybe uh, on teaching. And you understand that before we can teach people lessons and help them understand English and math and all these other kinds of things that we'd like to teach them, that, you know, we have to solve basic needs. They have to have been fed. They have to feel safe. They have to know that they're warm and, and taken care of. They have to know that there's, they're in a secure environment. And so these were top concerns for the first century church. They were concerned about, you know, what they were going to eat and what they were going to wear. Now, if the first century church were here today and they walked around with us and they saw our lives, they would be, they would think we wouldn't have anything to worry about at all. Because, you know, you and I, we're not worrying really about food. You know, we know that we're taken care of there and we we live in a prosperous nation, and, and even when things really go bad, we can, we can usually find food somewhere, some way to get food, some way to be taken care of. And clothing, you know, many of us are going to our closets and we're taking stuff out, we're putting it in the yard sale, or we're taking it down to Plato's closet and selling it, or, or whatever we're doing, you know, but we have more clothes than we need, and they would look at us and say, wow, you must have nothing to worry about. You have your food taken care of, and a closet full of clothes, you must not have a care in the world. But what they wouldn't understand is that we and our generation have mastered worry, haven't we? We've become the masters of worry. We worry about tuition, you know? We worry about, you know, uh, if what we don't have. Imagine that. I mean, we are concentrating so much energies and time sometimes. We'll see stuff on TV or we'll see our neighbors get something. We're worried about what we don't have. We're, we're concerned, uh, we, have a, we spend a great deal of time worrying about our future, and uh, what am I going to be, what's my job, what's my career, we spend a lot of time worrying about retirement, am I going to have enough money, you know, to get all the way through retirement, we spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, who am I going to marry, uh, we worry about our kids, we worry about community, we worry about what the neighbors think about us, you know, the, the, he just mowed his lawn and trimmed his hedges. I need to get out there and do that because, you know, they're going to think poorly of me or, or they're going to think bad about me. And so we're constantly worrying, aren't we? We have mastered it in our generation. But Jesus knew that all of these worries that you and I have are always about the future. And so he said in Matthew 6 and 25, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Is it true that your life is bigger than food or clothing? Your life is bigger than then a lot of the things that you've been concerned about or worrying about and has so been so fixated on. But suddenly in Jesus' teaching right here, it's as if he loses his train of thoughts. Isn't, you know, he, just, he says, you know, isn't life more than food and more than clothing? And then it's just like Jesus loses his train of thought. He goes, look at the birds. <laughs> <laughs> and these guys are like, I don't need time to look at the birds. I'm listening. I need some help. Tomorrow I have an interview. I have to meet my girlfriend's parents this weekend, and they hate me. And, you know, they don't even know me yet. There's all kinds of things that are bothering me. I don't have enough money to get to the end of the month. I need something from you. I can't look at the birds. He goes, look at the birds. So I, I can imagine, in, as he's teaching in this crowd, everybody suddenly like, oh, the birds. <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> oh, it was squirrel. And so Jesus points this out. Then Jesus says to them, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable than they are? 
Now, Jesus is saying, first of all, you have an extraordinary advantage over the rest of creation. Because only you has God given the ability to plant and to harvest. Which means that you can have an effect on your tomorrow by planning. You can, you can prepare for tomorrow. Uh, you can uh, certainly, you know, get strategize and get ready for things that may come. You can have some contingency plans. There is something you can do that will affect your tomorrows. And none of the rest of creation has that ability. He says, well, look at the birds. <laughs> you know, they can't plant or sow or do anything. So the Father takes care of them. He feeds them. Now you can. And so if you starve your family to death, it's because you did not plant and you did not harvest, you know, and, and he says, you know, I've given you that ability. So first he wants to point that out to them. And then he says, are you not more valuable to him than they are? Now this question really gets to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? Because remember earlier he had asked them, can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? Your worrying can't do anything that add anything to your life. It's not going to add any moments to the life of others that are around you. Verse 28, he says, and why do you worry about clothes? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers, the field grow, and they do not labor, and they do not spin. He's saying, look, you know, even grass and flowers, he said, they're not, they're not laboring, they don't prepare. And he said, they, uh, they have no concept of the future. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. They just, in all their glory, you know, do what God has commanded them to do. In verse 29, he says, Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of the splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Now, I, I think there's a big dramatic pause after Jesus says this. They're here today and thrown into the fire. Everybody's kind of thinking about it. Yeah, the grass, it does. It's a very short season. God takes care of that. He takes care of the birds of the air. He feeds them. All of this, God takes care of. And then he asked this question, which again gets to the very heart of the matter of worry. Will he not much more clothe you? Will he not much more clothe you? You see, really, when we get to... The crux of this issue is about trust. Do I trust God who's with me today to meet me tomorrow? Do I trust God who has provided for me in my past and in my present to do the same going forward? Do I believe that God knows everything that's happening? That not a breath that you have taken today that not an issue that has arisen in your life this week, this month, this year, has escaped his attention. For not one moment has he not been attentive to every single thing that has happened in your life. Do I trust him to take care of my tomorrows? And so Jesus punctuates the teaching at the end with this. He says, you of little faith. Now, in the original language, it's kind of interesting when you go back and you look at this, because it appears in the original language that what he probably said was something like this. He said, you little faithers, you. <laughs> and the people did just what you did right there. They laughed. You know, took the pressure off her. <laughs> yeah, you're a little faither too, yeah. <laughs> Remember all the things God's done for us? Remember how God's taken care of us? Why do we have such little faith? And the crowd, you know, got the point. How big is God? How important are you? Now here's the problem, again, it is trust. We don't really wake up every day trusting God. Verse 31, he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? As Jesus wants to tie this in and help them understand why not to do this. Don't wake up thinking, 
What am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? How am I going to be taken care of? Because he, he really brings it home in the next verse here, in verse 32. He says, For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now, the word pagan there is not intended to be an offensive word or to class a particular kind of individual. It just means everybody who's not following me. This is how everybody else is acting. They're pursuing these things. Their mind is always on these things. They're always after what's going to happen. How am I, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? Uh, what's what's going to happen tomorrow? They're, they're, there's so much worry and so much concern. They can't fixate or focus on the moment of what, what is happening and what God may be doing in their life or wanting to do in their life. They're so fixated on tomorrow and the future and what's going on there that they're not living in the present. And he said, don't be like them because that's how the pagans are. They run after. But instead, here's what I want you to do. And he says it in verse 32 in this um, particular screen you can see. For the pagans run after, but seek first. The pagans run after, but you're not them. Remember, you're not everyone else. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to seek first. Seek first. Verse 33, whether we all know, we can say it together. Let's, in fact, let's do that when it comes up on the screen here. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. One more time, let's read it together. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Let me summarize what Jesus is saying here in this passage for us so that we can really get our minds around it, okay? He's saying, when you're tempted to wonder and to worry about tomorrow, look for ways to participate in what God is doing today. When you're tempted to worry, to wonder about tomorrow, look to participate in what God is doing today. It is the enemy's job to always, you know, really, I think all of sin can be summed up in what I didn't get, what I don't have. Didn't it start in the, in the garden with Adam and Eve, and God says, all of these trees you can have, and, you know, this is your, you know, everything here I want you to manage and to be custodian over, and I've given it to you, and the fresh water, and, and everything that's here, and the animals, and all of this, there's one little tree over here that I'm holding for myself, so leave that one alone. That's okay, I'll take care of it. Everything else you manage. What does Satan come up and do? God cheated you. He didn't give you everything. There's a tree he's withholding from you. There's something you didn't get. And all of our worries are about what we didn't get, what we don't have, what, what, what we need, what we think we need, that is in our tomorrow. And it moves us in that, in that direction constantly. And so verse 34, and I want you to write these, this phrase down and put a line under it because we're going to fill it in, okay? It says, uh, therefore do not worry about. You see the line there? What is it that you're worrying about? I want you to write it in there. If, it, if you don't have a pen, you're not taking notes, then I want you to do it mentally. Put it in that, on that line. What is it? Finances, relationships. Do not worry about finances. Do not worry about relationships. Do not worry. Whatever it is, put it in there. Okay? Got it? Yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Jesus said, from now on, whatever you're tempted to worry about, I want you to relabel. So instead of labeling it finances, uh, labeling it uh, relationships, uh, whatever we're going to put the label on there, we're going to change it. And he says, verse 34 really reads, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. We're going to relabel everything the enemy tries to put in that box. Instead of, instead of saying the finances or relationships or, you know, my car or my job, we're going to put tomorrow. He says, first of all, I want you to relabel it because I want you to get a proper perspective. It's all ahead of you. And I'm here in your today, but I'm also waiting for you tomorrow. God's not constrained by time. 
He's been in our past and in our present and he's in our future. He's waiting for you tomorrow. Hey, glad you made it. Good, we got a lot to do today. He's already there. Just like he's here right now in this moment. So Jesus went on to say to them in verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And everyone said, Amen. I want you to say this with me. My heavenly father is with me today and is waiting for on me tomorrow. Let's say it together. My heavenly father is with me today and is waiting on me tomorrow. It's trust versus work. And so recapturing a little bit of this, how many of you have used worry and it solved any problems for you? How many of you have seen worry add another moment to your life? How many of you have seen worry really produce something fruitful for your life? So it's trust that we need. It's the crux of what we're talking about today. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus told them in, in John chapter 14, verse 1, because it was a problem, this worry thing, all the way up to the crucifixion. So Jesus is teaching his disciples, said, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then in verse 27 out of John chapter 14, he says to them, peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you uh, as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then Jesus was crucified. They watched him be crucified. They watched him die. They watched him be buried. The stone be rolled over. And everything that Jesus said, everything Jesus said seemed to carry no weight anymore with the first century church. It was over. Everything that he had said, don't worry, don't fear, it seemed like that it was all gone and over. We said it in the first week, we talked about how they watched him die, and then three days later, they had lunch with him. And so Jesus rose from the dead, and he punctuated everything that he said. And he said, if I'm, if I'm big enough to predict my death, my burial, and my resurrection, then I can take care of your tomorrow. I can be there and take care of your tomorrow. 32 years later, Paul wrote uh, to the first century church similar words. He had really learned the lesson. He came along late to the party, you may remember. Um, knocked off of a horse and was persecuting Christians and Jesus showed up. And so Paul came a little bit late to the party, but he learned the lesson because the resurrection uh, religion, you know, was emphasized by Jesus' resurrection and his power to do what he said he was going to do. And so Paul said to them in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. And then he says again in Philippians 4, 7, just like Jesus was saying, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We're arriving now at application. We've walked through with Jesus the things that Jesus, you know, wants us to understand about worry and how we are to not worry. And so in order to put this into practice, there are three things that I want you to do this week, okay? The number one, the first thing that I'd like you to do is to begin your day by declaring your trust in Jesus. Begin your day by declaring that you trust Jesus. Start your day with God. However your day begins, whatever your patterns are, whatever your habits are, I go, I get up, I grab a cup of coffee first, then I go get a shower, or I go to the shower, then I get a cup, whatever it is, insert into your daily habit. This morning, Lord, I'm awake, and I trust you with my day, and I don't want to miss one divine appointment that you set for my life. I trust that you're here to meet me today. Thank you for providing what I need today, today. The second thing I want you to do is what we talked about earlier here is relabel all of your worry about, you know, the things that you're worrying about, relabel them tomorrow. Stop focusing on, on what God is, is doing and, uh, you know, maybe not doing in your mind and focus on what God is doing today. What, is he, what, is, what has God got, God got going on that I need to participate in, that I need to function in? Let me get my mind off of my 
cares and worries and things like this. And one of the best ways you can do this is to pray for other people. One of the wonderful things about, uh, I guess, wonderful and, you know, you can get a little heavy at times too about social networking is you keep up with just hundreds of friends all over the country and things that are going on in their life. And quite often you will um, turn it on for the day and realize that some of your friends are in trouble. There's, there's been a death, there's been a loss, there's, there's some kind of need that's arisen and they will put up some kind of a prayer request. So it's easy for us to find needs. It's very easy to find those who are reaching out for Jesus. And, and so that might be a good way for you to get this thing started, but start praying for someone else. When we get our minds focused outside of ourselves, it really transforms the whole situation. It takes on new meaning because a lot of worry is, is always focused on self, focused on me, 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 what I don't have, what I need. Where are you, God? What's going on? I need you. I need you to provide for this. I need you to take care of this. When we get outside of that, we start praying for someone else. We realize that God is big and he's taking care of these situations. He's watching over us. He's watching over our circumstance. And that sometimes there are people who have bigger needs than what we think we have. And when we lift them up to God, it really is transforming. So those two things. And the third one is, when you worry about tomorrow, stop and focus on what God is doing today. Start with something um, that really matters for eternity. You know, really get your, your eyes zeroed in on, on what God is, is doing around you and in you in that moment. And, and just zero in on that and let God do that work. I'm inviting our worship team to come. And I want to ask you a few questions. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? Who of you, by worrying, can improve a down economy, can change a mind, can heal a heart? If you answer that like I do, which is not me, <laughs> then I think we best leave tomorrow in God's hands. And we zero in on what God wants to do in us. And this morning, you know, uh, as, as I felt last night, God, I really believe God wants to lift some burdens off of some shoulders. There are some of you that are carrying around a weight that God never intended for you to carry. And it's these worries and these concerns. And it may not be for yourself. It might be for um, parents, for friends, for loved ones around you. But you have just allowed yourself to be loaded down with the cares of life. And God is saying to you in this moment that he is here to lift them up if you'll let him happen. He's not going to come and just unburden you outside of your, your will and your desire. But if you're here this morning and say, God, I want to give this up to you. I believe that you are not only here today, but you're waiting for me tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And you've got all of that taken care of. I love what Vanessa read that was so beautiful about her friend. If you're asking me where I'm at, I'm in resting in the Lord because he's already made his decision about what's going to happen with this healing. And I'm just resting. I'm, just, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to fret about it. But I'm just going to rest in Jesus because he is here today, but he's also waiting for me tomorrow. Will you stand with me as we worship the Lord at some